Friends, you have to understand this. The purpose of this study is not just to show how close we are to the fall of spiritual modern Babylon. Not spiritual in a good sense, but mystery Babylon, modern day Babylon in these last days. But these signs are also to show us that the second coming of Jesus Christ is very, very near. I hope that point is clear, friends. So now, before we can understand how close we are to the fall of modern day Babylon and the second coming of Jesus Christ, we must study and understand the factors that led to the fall of ancient Babylon, the Tower of Babel, Babylon, in Bible history times. And as we look at those factors that led to the fall of the Tower of Babel, Babel means Babylon. As we look at those factors that led to the fall of the Tower of Babel, the fall of the Tower of Babylon, then we can better understand how close we are to the fall of mystery, Babylon in these last days, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you want to go home? Do you want to make it in with Jesus when he returns a second time? Do you want to be saved? Then we must understand the signs of the times. Are you ready now, my friends? Look with me. Genesis chapter 10. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 10, we're looking now at Nimrod, who erected and established the kingdom of Babel. Babel means Babylon. And look with me at verse number 8. The Bible tells us that Nimrod, and first of all, what does the name Nimrod mean? If you look up the word Nimrod in the Strong's Exhaustive Bible Concordance, the word Nimrod, the name Nimrod, it means a tyrant. Nimrod means a rebel. Nimrod is somebody who rebelled against God. And since Nimrod established the kingdom of Babel, the kingdom of Babylon, the Bible is telling us that Nimrod was the first individual after the flood in the days of Noah to establish a kingdom and ran that kingdom contrary to to God. This is the kingdom of Babylon. Look with me. Verse number 8, Genesis chapter 10. The Bible says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He was a mighty hunter, meaning he was rebellious against God. And verse number 10 says, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel means Babylon. Remember now, follow me here. In the book of Genesis, we're looking at Genesis chapter 10. Amen? What great climatic event transpired in Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9. This is the flood in the days of Noah. And in chapter 10 of Genesis and chapter 11 of Genesis, we find the account of Nimrod establishing the kingdom of Babel. And he ran that kingdom, operated that kingdom against God. He was a tyrant. He was a rebel. So Nimrod represent a person in these last days who is attempting to establish a kingdom contrary to the God of heaven. I wonder, who does Nimrod represent today? Nimrod, who erected and established the kingdom of Babel. Well, Nimrod would represent in the primary sense the papacy. Look at what this says, my friends. Note that very, very carefully. Nimrod represents the papacy. Why? The papacy is a mystery. Babylon the Great and the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth based on Revelation chapter 17, verse 3 through verse number 6. Look with me now at Genesis chapter 11. What factors led to the fall of the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel? What led to this? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 11 that Nimrod erected and founded a city and a tower. Why a city and a tower? 
Look with me at Genesis chapter 11. The Bible is showing us here that the city would represent a civil entity. Nimrod established, he founded the kingdom of Babel. Genesis 10 and verse number 10. That means Nimrod is a civil entity. He represents a civil entity. Why? He established a city. The tower, as we shall find out, represents a place of worship. Represents a religious entity. So Nimrod represents a person in these last days who will unite church entity and state entity. Church and state. And once Nimrod join church and state, the Bible tells us that God brought destruction upon the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel. As it was then, so shall it be in these last days. Look with me. Genesis chapter 11, verse number 1, verse number 2, verse number 3. Focus now on verse number 4. Bible says, and they said, go to, let us build us a city, underscore city, and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So now let's deal with the tower. What does a tower represent? The tower represents a place of worship. Hold your place in the 11th chapter of Genesis. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Look with me at verse number 10. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The tower represents God's character, the name of the Lord. God's character. The tower represents a place where men can run into and are safe or they receive salvation the tower represents a place to receive salvation the tower represents a place of worship write down psalm 18 let's go there psalm 18 the bible tells us in psalm 18 so nimrod established a tower a place of worship so when nimrod established the kingdom of Babel. In the center of that kingdom was a tower, a place of worship. So Nimrod persuaded and compelled the people to worship. Now, since Nimrod was a tyrant, was a rebel against God, that means that system of worship, that tower represents false worship. Is that clear, my friends? Amen. Look with me. Psalm 18 and verse number two, Bible says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. The tower represents a place of worship. Go back with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 10. So now it says also that Nimrod, Builded him a city and a tower. In the natural sense, the city represents a civil entity. All right? And Nimrod was a king. So Nimrod joined church and state. When this took place, the Bible tells us the tower of Babylon fell. Look with me. The 11th chapter of Genesis. Look now at verse number 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babylon because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. This is what led to the fall of the Tower of Babel. Question now, why did Nimrod unite church and state in the days of his kingdom? The Tower of Babel, as a result, Babylon fell. Why did Nimrod unite church and state, build the city and the tower? The Bible tells us that Nimrod did this in order he was attempting to preserve the world from great destruction. Bear in mind, friends, in chapter 6 of Genesis through chapter 10 of Genesis, we find the account of the flood. So Nimrod was erecting this project 
as high above the heaven in, in an attempt, watch this, to preserve the world from destruction. But bear in mind, God had already said to Noah after the flood that he would not destroy the world by water again. So Nimrod was really a tyrant. He represents a person who had rejected the word of God, who had rejected the prophecies of God, who had rejected the promises of God. I would not destroy this earth with water again. So why was Nimrod building this tower? Listen to what this says. Oh, my friends, this is Christ's object lessons, page 200. And 87 confirming the tower represents a place of worship, it says. And as the tower in the vineyard, God placed in the midst of the land his holy temple. Listen now, friends. This is patriarchs and prophets, page 119. This statement confirms what Nimrod was attempting to do. It says, one object before them in the erection of the tower was to secure their own safety in case of another deluge by carrying the structure to a much greater height than was reached by the waters of the flood they thought to place themselves beyond all possibility of danger is that clear my friends so now go back with me so why was nimrod building this project why did nimrod establish this city and tower joining church and state it was for the sole purpose to preserve the earth from great calamity look with me now chapter 11 of genesis let's confirm that one more time in verse number four and they said go to let us build us a city state power and a tower church power whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth but god had already given to man a name so what are the name were they attempting to receive a name contrary to the words of God, Nimrod was a rebel. Nimrod was a tyrant. Who does Nimrod represent today? The papacy. And friends, question. Is the papacy now attempting to unite church power and state power in order to combat climate change? In order to preserve the world from great calamities? The answer is yes. So now we have the antitype of the Tower of Babel in past times. Listen to what this says, my friends. Pope Francis pleads with nations to act now, when friends, to act now on climate change. So is he now appealing to statesmen? Nation, nations, and the leaders of various nations to accept his policies, to accept his doctrines, his instructions, his stipulations to address climate change, to preserve the world from another great calamity. The answer is yes. Watch this, friends. National Catholic Reporter, September 2015, headline reads, Encyclical. Unites religious and non religious voices on what? On climate change. That's clear, my friends. So it is evident, oh, friends, it is evident that the Pope's encyclical on climate change, Lord, that to see the papacy, the Pope, he's trying to get the nations and the churches to all unite to combat climate change to preserve the world from another calamity the papacy is the modern day nimrod so what is going on now this movement to combat climate change in paris france this month december 2015 it's none other than another tower of babel being erected before our very eyes if that's clear my friend say amen go with me Chapter 18 of the Revelation, 
We want to find out regarding Babylon. Mr. Babylon, the papacy. The Bible tell us, tells us that before the papacy completely falls, the Bible tells us the papacy will be serving wine to the nations, serving wine to the kings, presidents, leaders, princes of various nations before mystery. Babylon falls before the second coming of Jesus Christ takes place. The Bible tells us that mystery Babylon will be serving the merchants of the earth her wine. Let's read that and let's begin to analyze what these things mean and look at current events to substantiate Bible prophecy so we can see and know without a shadow of a doubt. Probation's hour is about to close. Jesus Christ is soon to come. Are you ready? Look with me. Chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Verse number 2 says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become. The habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and a hateful bird. And verse number three says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication. Notice now, who friends? The nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication. Number two, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies write down those three entities the nations will drink babylon's wine the kings will drink babylon's wine and number three it says the merchants of the earth will all be drinking of babylon's wine and when this takes place it shows that babylon is about to completely fall and the second coming of jesus is about to become a reality because verse number four of chapter 18 says come out from among her my people come out of her now comes the question what does babylon's wine mean write down the wine of babylon represents deception the wine of babylon represents false doctrines false policies and the context of our study is that nimrod in bible times joined church and state the city and the tower to preserve in an attempt to preserve the world from a great calamity in the last days then the papacy even pope francis will be serving wine false doctrines false policies and get the nations the leaders of various nations the kings and the merchants to accept that wine accept those false policies and false doctrines so that they may attempt to preserve the world from another great calamity the wine represents deception false doctrines hold your place in chapter 18 of the revelation go with me to proverbs chapter 20 Proverbs chapter 20, listen to what this statement says in Great Controversy, page 388, mark this, Great Controversy, page 388, as you're going to Proverbs 20, verse number 1, listen now, Proverbs 20, verse number 1 says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby, deceived with the wine is not wise so the wine represents deception look with me proverbs chapter 31 go there proverbs chapter 31 while you're going there let me quote now from great controversy page 388 it says the great sin charge against babylon is that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication this cup of intoxication which she presents to the world represents the false doctrines what friends the false doctrines that she has accepted as the result of her unlawful connection with the great ones of the earth all right proverbs chapter 31 verse number four 
It says, it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes uh, strong drink. Why? Verse 5, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. It's not for kings to drink wine. For those who drink of this wine, even Babylon's wine, in our context for these last days, the Bible says they will forget the law. Whose law? God's law. And out of all of God's Ten Commandments, which one specifically does God say everyone must not forget but remember? The fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So as the nations drink of the papers' is wine, as the kings drink of the papers' is wine, as the merchants of the earth drink of the wine of Babylon, the wine of the papacy, they will then for, they will then forget. They will then cast aside. They will pass laws to discard God's seventh day Sabbath, even to enforce a national Sunday law. Go back with me to Proverbs 31, verse number four. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is, it, it is not for kings to drink wine. The Bible is telling us kings should not drink wine. Yet, what is the warning? What will the kings of the earth be doing in the last days just before Babylon completely falls and the second coming of Christ takes place? It says uh, the kings of the earth commit fornication with her. The nations will be drinking her wine. The merchants of the earth will be drinking her wine. Question. I gave you three things to write down, three en entities. The nations, the kings, and the merchants. Now, are the nations now partaking of the papacy's wine? The wine from Pope Francis, the false doctrines, and the policies of Pope Francis. And the context here is to combat climate change. Is that going on right now? You better believe it. Look at this, my friend. This is the Guardian newspaper, November 2015. It says, headline, Global Climate March 2015. So all around the world, hundreds of thousands march around the world. For what purpose? Headline, look at these pictures. It says, People's Climate March. So why are they marching? The nations and the people, they are marching because they want the leaders who are present in Paris even now as we are studying to accept the policies from Laudato Si, Pope Francis' encyclical on climate change. Look at this, friends. That was the nations. What about the kings? Look at this. It says, and first, look at this picture here. Look at these uh, banners. Big one in the center, front and center. We sent a message to Paris. It says uh, over 2,300 plus events, over 175 countries, almost, almost a million people march all around the world. Look now, these are the kings. Oh, friends, can you see it? New York Times, it says, uh, headline, citing urgency. World leaders converge, oh friends, world leaders converge on France for climate talks. Look with me. Look at this. It says on NPR News this November 2015. It says, watch this carefully, friends. Are, are they now marching? Look now at the merchants. NPR News. It says here, Bill Gates and other billionaires pledge to take on what? To take on climate change. Do you see, my friends? The nations are now marching. They want the leaders to accept the policies of Pope Francis to combat climate change. The leaders are also there. From France, from Germany, even presidents, prime ministers from the Caribbean, the West Indies, those from Europe, those from Australia, those from Asia, they're all there at Paris, France, 
So now the kings are drinking of Babylon's wine, even the merchants of the earth. Go back with me to chapter 18 of Revelation. Father in heaven, please dear God, help us to understand what this means. In Christ's name we pray. Look friends, chapter 18 of the Revelation. Are the nations now drinking Babylon's wine? Yes. Are the kings now drinking Babylon's wine? What about the merchants? Chapter 18, verse number 3. For all nations, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth. Have we seen that now? Yes. Are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And what says verse number 4? And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her my people that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues so what is about to fall my friends the seven last plagues so as we see the nations are marching saying yes our leaders accept the policies of the Pope to combat climate change as we see the kings are drinking Babylon's wine. The billionaires of the world, the merchants are now drinking of the Pope's wine, uniting with him to combat climate change and to save the world from another great calamity. It shows them the seven last plagues are about to be poured out. The second coming of Christ is near. And guess what? What event must take place before the seven last plagues are poured out? It is the mark of the beast. Chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse number 9 says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of of God and what is the wrath of God chapter 15 verse 1 of the revelation says it is the seven last plagues are we here my friends Luke chapter 2 go there with me my friends where we're going to Luke the second chapter my friends oh beloved are these points clear do you see how current events has now shown us where we are based on the 18th chapter of the Revelation. That the tower, the modern tower of Babel is now being erected. The churchmen are drinking Babylon's wine. The statesmen are now drinking Babylon's wine. The nations are drinking the wine of Babylon. The merchants of the earth are presently drinking the wine of Babylon. What is next? the mark of the beast and then and then will come the call come out from among her my people that you receive not of her sins don't become partakers of her sins and receive her plagues the seven last plagues are about to be poured out and for the plagues to be poured out jesus must stand up my friends oh beloved is that clear? Before the plagues are poured out, Christ must close probation. Oh, beloved, again, before those seven last plagues are poured out, Christ must say, it is done. So how close are we for Christ to close the work of probation? For once those plagues are being poured out, it shows there's no more opportunity for a person to be saved. Probation's hour is fast closing. I'm going to show you something, friends. Oh, beloved, listen to me. It's not by accident this meeting is going on in Paris, France. I'm going to show you this meeting going on in Paris, France to combat climate change. It is a prophetic fulfillment. It showed the second coming of Christ is even at the doors. Wake up, Save to Serve International. It's time for us to be about our father's business, doing, doing missionary work very aggressively. Luke chapter 2, look with me. In Luke chapter 2, what we are going to see is simply this, that when Christ was born, during the first advent of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us the nations of the earth were taxed. 
Why am I emphasizing this? What, Pastor? Why am I emphasizing this point during the first advent of Christ when Christ was about to be born in the world? The Bible emphasizes the point all the nations were taxed in that day. What does this signify today? Friends, the only primary movement project that is leading to all the nations of earth being taxed. It's the climate change project. The climate change project will cause all the nations of earth to be taxed. Now, friends, if a nation, if nations are being taxed, it simply means then there's no longer uh, national boundaries. For example, if I'm living in the States right now in America, all right, can the Prime Minister of Jamaica tax me? Cannot be done. Why? Because the Prime Minister and the heads of state in Jamaica does not have jurisdiction of the citizens of America. Amen. So now, if our nations are going to be taxed, it simply means that somebody has broken down the national boundaries of every nation. It means this is a one world government, my friends. Oh yes, so now this movement for climate change will bring about the one world government. And somebody, the Bible says, will sit as the head of this one world government government the one world agenda it is the papacy look with me at luke chapter 2 jesus is soon to come luke chapter 2 verse 1 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from caesar augustus that all again that all the world should be taxed caesar augustus the emperor of the Roman power began taxing the world, showing all national boundaries were removed. The Roman Empire was now the world's superpower. And friends, the primary movement today that will lead to all nations being taxed is the climate change movement. Oh, friends, listen to what I'm saying here. Hear God's spirit speaking to us. Now, since Pope Francis, his mouth is loudest, he's driving this movement to get every nation to sign off and accept his policies to combat climate change. If all nations are going to be taxed, who is going to be the one taxing every other nation? Who, my friends? It is the papacy. Yes, through her agents, it's the papacy through ad hoc committees it's the papacy through her subsidiary groups out there it's the papacy and daniel chapter 11 verse 40 through verse 45 specifically verse 41 through verse 43 the bible tells us the papacy will control all the gold and silver and precious stones this climate change movement this is what the Pope said recently to all the leaders in Paris, France, who are convening to accept the policies of La Dato Si to combat climate change. He says, it is now or never as if he's forcing their hands to accept his policies. All the nations will be taxed. Beloved, this is how Luke 2 begins. In the context of the birth of Christ, listen to what this says. It says here, friends, this is CNS News. It says December 1st, 2015, headline reads, Obama says a new tax is the most elegant way to stop what? To stop climate change. Look at this one, friends. It says here, Al Jazeera News. It says, watch headline it reads congressional republicans have vowed to block any contribution any monies any funds to the united nations climate fund so what is the issue here 
Every nation will be taxed. Have you ever heard of carbon tax? Yes, every nation will be taxed. And other reasons why other nations will be taxed, friends. National boundaries will fall away. A one world government, a one world order. Who will be the one controlling the funds? And friends, bear in mind, the Vatican, the Vatican is the only, I believe, the only, I believe, the only nation entity that does not pay taxes. The Vatican, friends, the only one, and now every nation will be taxed. And Luke chapter 2 is showing us the context of the birth of Jesus Christ. Look with me. Verse number 7 says of Luke 2, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Pause right there. In the context of Christ being born, the first advent of Jesus, the Bible says, all nations were taxed. What is about to take place due to, let's come back, climate change? All the nations are going to be taxed. So what great event? is about to take place the second coming of jesus christ is this a reality to you my friend is this a reality in the context of luke chapter 2 when all the nations the bible says every nation was taxed the bible said in that context jesus was born and notice now the bible says an angel descended from glory that angel came down to now announce to God's professed people, the Savior is born. And the Bible and the spirit of prophecy say that angel hovered over the synagogues in Jerusalem. And we are told not one pastor, not one elder, not one priest, not one minister in the synagogue was prepared to receive the announcement that the Savior was born. Not one person in the pew, in the synagogue, was prepared to receive the message from the angel that the Savior was born, and now they must go forward to proclaim that message in the context when all nations were taxed what is going on now, my friends? Every nation is about to be taxed. Developing nations and the, the developed nations. Every nation is about to be taxed. Could this be then, friends? God is now sending his message. Yet, the pastors within Seventh-day Adventism and the members in the pews and chairs are ignorant and are unprepared to receive the message that the second coming of Christ is near? The answer is yes. That angel hovered over the, the church schools, the schools of the rabbis. Not one rabbi, not one professor, not one student, not one pupil in the schools of the rabbi, in the seminaries, in the church schools in that time. When all nations were being taxed, was prepared to receive the message, the Savior is born in the first advent, now receive it and go proclaim it. As it was then, how shall it be today? Oh friends, professors and students are ignorant of the signs of the times. Probation is about to close. Babylon is about to completely fall. The second coming of Jesus is even at the doors. Listen to what this says, my friends. Great controversy. Page 314 says, An angel visits the earth to see who are prepared to welcome Jesus, but he can discern no tokens of expectancy. He hears no voice of praise and triumph that the period of Messiah's coming is at hand. 
That serious friends, the angel hovered over the churches in the first during the first advent, and not one pastor, not one elder was emphasizing the signs of the times that the first advent was near as it was then so shall it be it says reading on the angel hovers for a time over the chosen city and the temple where the divine presence has been manifested for ages but even here is the same indifference the priests in their pomp and pride are offering polluted sacrifices in the temple. What could that represent today? Pastors who are preaching false doctrines in the pulpits while the nations are about to be taxed. Babylon is about to completely fall. The second coming of Christ is even at the doors. Wake up, my friends. Read on. It says, watch. It says, the Pharisees are with loud voices addressing the people are making boastful prayers at the corners of the streets i wonder what could that represent today well it represents seventh day adventist leaders pastors administrators holding all these conferences should we ordain women to become elders and priests all these conferences while probation's hour is fast closing. It says, don't get me started, friends. It says, in the palaces of kings, in the assemblies of philosophers, in the schools of the rabbis, all are alike unmindful of the wondrous fact which has filled all heaven with joy and praise that the Redeemer of men is about to appear upon the earth. Go with me, my friends. Go with me. Luke chapter 2. So who was ready to receive the message? The Messiah is here. Who was ready to receive the message of Christ in the first advent? To find Christ and to proclaim that message. The Bible says, inspiration says, it was not the pastors of the synagogues, which would represent today the pastors within the conference of churches, within Seventh-day Adventism. Not one rabbi, not one professor of theology at Andrews University, Oakwood, Southern, PUC, Walla Walla, Loma Linda, not one, not one. Caribbean, you not one. So who were the ones prepared, friends? The Bible says it was the lonely shepherds on the hill who were watching their flocks by night. Not only literal night, but the day was about to start. The first advent of Christ. That night represents the darkest hour of earth's period. When the churches and the world are in steep apostasy. So who would those shepherds represent who were watching their flocks by night? In the time period when the nations were being taxed and the pastors and the professors of theology in the church schools were unprepared to receive the angel's message from glory. The first advent is here. The shepherds would represent self-supporting pastors, elders in these last days, those who are holding their flocks, the people God gives to them under their care, the overseers of God's people, those who are not connected to the conferences of churches within Seventh-day Adventism. Those shepherds would represent maybe a house church, the husband, the elder, gathers people together and he is feeding them the words of prophecy, the words of Bible heart conversion. Or it may be an elder, a messenger, a father, a preacher who holds or leases or rents a building, owns a building, and people come there. For what purpose? To receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, present truth. Heart conversion, to be trained to become missionary, medical missionary evangelists in these last days. 
This, these shepherds would represent those who are sending out workers, identifying what these current events represent. Look with me. Luke 2 verse 8. And they were in the same country. Shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Pause right there, friends. Go back to verse number 7. Verse number 8 says, Bible says, when the Messiah was about to be born, there was no room in the inn. Where was this inn? Where was this inn that had no room to receive the Messiah at his first advent? It was in the same country where the shepherds were, and the shepherds were among the Jewish people, but not in the synagogues, but on a lonely hill, my friends. So this represents today people in the churches who find and make no place in their homes, in their hearts for Christ to come in. But those shepherds on the hill with those flock, sheep, God's people, they made room to receive Christ's word during the first advent. Listen to what this says, my friends. Great controversy. Page 314, it says, There is no evidence that Christ is expected and no preparation for the Prince of Life. In amazement, the celestial messenger is about to return to heaven with the shameful tidings. What a picture, friends. Listen. When he discovers a group of shepherds who are watching their flocks by night, and as they gaze into the starry heavens, are contemplating the prophecy of a Messiah to come to earth and longing for the advent of the world's Redeemer. Pause right there. So what were the shepherds and flocks doing on that lonely hill, friends? They were contemplating the prophecies of Christ, the Messiah's first advent. Oh, friends. Yet the majority of the churches among Seventh-day Adventists the pastors and elders are not contemplating Bible prophecy and the prophecies in the spirit of prophecy, which all show us based on current events. The second coming of Christ is near. Babylon is about to completely fall. They are showing the people what these current events mean, especially in our context this evening, what the Paris, France, climate, summit really means for god's people what are they doing they are sleeping in the church so who would represent then the shepherds and the flocks who were on the lonely hill in a time when all the nations were taxed listen here let's read on it says uh, here is a company that is prepared to what my friends to receive the heavenly message of Go with me, my friends, to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Write down this quotation. Great controversy. Page 314. Oh, friends, listen. In the same context, where the nations were being taxed, the first advent took place. And the pastors and the professors and the people in the synagogues in the schools of theology were ignorant of it. Only those shepherds and those flocks, I call them self-supporting, independent ministers of the conferences of churches, of Seventh-day Adventism. They represent such elders, such pastors, such messengers today. Only these faithful shepherds were prepared to receive the message of the first advent because they were contemplating the prophecies of the first advent of the Messiah. In the next paragraph, Great Controversy, page 314, it says now, it says there is no evidence. Then it says it was not on page 315, the second paragraph, it was not alone on the hills of Judea, not among the lowly shepherds only, that angels found the watchers 
for Messiah's coming in the land of the heathen also were those that looked for him. They were wise men, rich and noble, the philosophers of the East, students of nature, the Magi had seen God in his handiwork. So notice friends, in the context of the nations being taxed and the shepherds on the hills with the flock receiving the message of Christ's first advent, the Bible and inspiration also say, also the men from the East, the wise men from the East, men from heathen lands, they were prepared <laughs> to receive the message of the first advent of the Messiah while those in the church were ignorant. Wow. As it was in the first advent of Christ, so in the second advent of Christ, when the nations were being taxed, the angels came down from glory. Couldn't find a professor or priest in the temple of Jerusalem to receive that message, but the Magi were ready. They the shepherds on the lowly hill of Judea, they were the ones who were ready. Matthew chapter 2, go there with me, my friends. In Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1 onward, Bible tells us that these magi, the, the, the wise men from the east, Bible says they came to Jerusalem. And they asked the question, verse 2, Where is he that is to be born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. Friends, so this represents a time when those from heathen lands are prepared to worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. The wise men coming, saying, where is he? That is to be born, king of the Jews. We are come to worship him. The application is, this is when the loud cry is given. Praise God. And it's going forward right now. And people from Babylon, the sincere ones, will come and worship God on the true seven-day Sabbath and renowned Sunday worship. At this very time, what happened to Mary, Joseph, and Jesus? Look with me. Bible says that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus had to run away from persecution. Herod was about to persecute them. Wait a minute, friends. And what title, what label do we give individuals who are running away from persecution? We call them refugees. 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 And what is one of those issues permeating the news media outlets today? Refugees. Migration of refugees. Very, very soon, God's people. God's commandment keeping people are going to be the refugees in these last days running away from persecution. But what set the stage for this? It was in the time when all the nations were taxed and the shepherds received the gospel, not the priests, not the elders, not the professors, the rabbis. When the wise men from heathen land begin, began to receive the gospel, so it is now. This is a time when God's people are about to be refugees. In a time when all the nations are about to be taxed. Oh, friends. Oh, beloved. Is that point clear? This movement to combat climate change out of it. Every nation will be taxed. So who is going to be refugees in these last days? God's commandment keeping people. Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus were refugees. How many were slain in Jerusalem? Oh, friends, in that time. What is about to transpire in these last days? Oh, beloved, let me say this. This scripture must encourage us. Look with me. So how did Joseph 
receive instruction of where to flee due to persecution from Herod in the time when all the nations were taxed. The Bible says God gave Joseph a vision. Look with me. Verse number 13 of Mark 2, it says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And my question is, who gave Joseph? That word, persecution was coming, now flee as a refugee. Who gave him that warning? Who gave him protection? It was the angel of the Lord, my friends, in a dream. Application is persecution coming. Now that we're seeing the nations are about to be taxed, is persecution coming? The answer is yes. So my question is, are we so connected to Christ that we can receive instructions from the angel of the Lord in these last days? Friends, we are told in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 16, it says, it is impossible to give any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive upon the earth when celestial glory and a repetition of the persecutions of the past are blended. They will walk in the light proceeding from the throne of God by means of the angels. There will be constant communication between heaven and earth. Praise God. Just as an angel from God led Joseph, led Mary and baby Jesus to run away as refugees and to find safety. So God's faithful commandment keeping people who will be refugees in these last days will also be in constant communication with heaven but my friends when do you think we must be in constant communication with heaven to go through that very crisis which is soon to become a reality well the answer is it is now it is now evening morning and at noon we must tune our ears to hear the voice of jesus go back with me Genesis chapter 10. Beloved, can you see how close we are to the end, my friends? Babylon is about to fall completely. God's people are about to be refugees. Persecution is coming. But the second coming of Christ is even nearer. It is even at the doors. Go back with me. Genesis chapter 10. Again, what did Nimrod do to preserve the world? In his, his attempt to preserve the world from destruction, the Bible says he united church and state. Bible says Nimrod built a city and placed a tower in it. And the tower represents a place of worship. Now, is Pope Francis doing that today? Yes, my friends. The Pope has said the primary thing mankind must do in order to preserve the world from great calamity is for the nations to enact a Sunday law. Look at this, friends. This is Laudato Si. Friends, we know this. The last sentence says, And so the day of rest, Sunday, centered on the Eucharist, sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. Is that clear? The Pope is saying Sunday must be enacted as the law of the land, the day of worship by law, to preserve the world from calamities. But the point you must see here, friends, is this. When Nimrod erected church and state and compelled the people to go to that tower, build that tower, experience, conduct, practice, 
pagan style worship. Hear me now. The very calamity that they were trying to evade, the same calamity came and destroyed their project. Unite church and state to save our world from calamity. But once they erected and began to build that tower, the Bible says the same calamity they were trying to evade, the same calamity brought destruction to ancient Babel, ancient Babylon. Now let's make the application. The Pope is now saying every nation must enact a Sunday law and other things. The Sunday law to preserve the world from calamities, from destruction. But what will happen, friends? The same calamities that they are trying to stop and to hinder and to evade. God will send the seven last plagues and overthrow Babylon. Look with me, my friends. John chapter 11. Where are we going to, my friends? John chapter 11. And so we find a similar principle in the days of Jesus Christ. The Jews had said, we must crucify, we must kill, we must destroy Jesus. If we do not destroy Jesus, then the Romans will come and take away our place and nations. Now, did they crucify Jesus? Yes. And the very crisis they were trying to hinder, trying to evade. Let's preserve our nation from the Romans coming and destroying it. Let's crucify, let's kill Jesus. Once they crucified Jesus, rejected Christ, what happened to Jerusalem from the Romans, friends? Jerusalem, the city, was destroyed in the year AD 70. Listen, friends, right now, we are professed Seventh-day Adventists. Leaders and people, they are now rejecting Jesus because they want to be in harmony with the churches of the land. They want to be in harmony with ecumenism, with other religions. And their code words are, well, we are just observers on the ecumenical board of religions. Foolishness, friends. They are rejecting Christ and present truth in order to be one with the nations and one with the churches. And the very criticism that they are trying to evade will come upon them nevertheless. And these professed Seventh-day Adventists, pastors and people who are now marginalizing God's true and faithful preachers, God's true and faithful messengers, God's true and faithful missionaries, because they don't want to hear the straight testimony Let's bar these preachers from our churches, from our conferences, from our conventions. We don't want to hear such messages and we will find our way to heaven without those messages as they bar God's people and reject present truth. As a result, they will be lost. As a result, probation will close upon them as they shut out God's people. They are shutting out the truth. They are shutting away God's end time word, God's end time preachers. And when they realize what they have done, it is going to be too late. John chapter 11. You can read verse 47 and verse 48. You can read all the way down to verse number 54. We must destroy Christ. To preserve our nation. Look with me. Verse number 47. Verse 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. But what happened to them? Skip on down to verse number 53. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put Jesus to death. What happened to them in AD 70? The nation was destroyed by the Romans. The same group they were trying to evade destruction from 
as it was then, so it will be in these last days. The Pope is saying, nations, enact a Sunday law to preserve the world from destruction. But once that Sunday law is enforced by all these nations, the law of the land, what will come thereafter? The seven last plagues. Have you ever heard the Pope say, we must enact Sunday to take care of our common home. Our what, friends? Don't forget that. And for Sunday to take care, to preserve our common home from destruction. Even Obama and the other leaders are saying, we will, we will compel our citizens to accept the policies of Laudato Si to preserve this world, our common home. Friends, one thing is clear. God's true Christians, God's true people cannot join with the Pope and his agents, cannot accept the policies of Laudato Si, Sunday laws. Hear me, to take care and preserve our common home from destruction because this world is not our home. Listen to your friends. It says, Laudato Si, headline. It says, on care for our common home. Look here. This is from the White House press. It says, watch, Obama is saying, let's accept the post policies to preserve this world, our common home. This world is not our home, friends. Oh, beloved. This world is not our home. This is why God's Christians, God's faithful commandment keeping people cannot join with this movement to combat climate change, to take care of our common home. This world is not our home. This world belongs to Satan, my friends. This world is not our home. And think about this. Satan does not want this home, this earth to be destroyed. Mm, 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 mm. So now the devil is working through the Pope and the merchants and the kings of the earth and the nations, the people to preserve this earth because Satan knows this place is the only place he will ever have. He doesn't want this place to be destroyed. But what does God's word say? This world is coming to an end. This world is not our home. Go with me. Hebrews chapter 11, friends. Hebrews chapter 11. And if we understood the gospel, we will realize this earth is not our home. Our home is in the new city, friends. Our home, new Jerusalem. Our home, when Christ destroys this earth, this world, and make it new. This, that will be our home. So now, friends, since this is not our home, who are we in this earth then? We are but pilgrims. We are but strangers. We are sojourners. This is not our home. We are pilgrims, strangers, and sojourners on this earth. Look with me. Hebrews chapter 11. It says in verse number 8, By faith, Abraham. When he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. Pause right there my friend. So we're... Was Abraham at this time? It says Abraham was in the land of promise. Where was that? Literal Canaan. But how did Abraham feel when he put foot in the earth land of promise? That inheritance. He felt as if he were a stranger. Notice friends, that means Abraham did not view this earth as his home. Praise God. And those who shall be saved, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, 12 tribes. Those who will make up that number, the 100 
and 40 and 4,000 will never look at this earth as their home. Praise God, friends. This is not our home. And this is one reason why Satan wants to get us caught up in worldly careers. Owning a home, a house. Friends, you can never really own a house down here. Even if you pay off the mortgage, don't pay your taxes, and you will see what happened. You will lose that, that house. He wants us to get caught up with jobs and careers and homes and, and property, land and businesses down here. For Christ said in Luke 12, where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Listen to me carefully, friends. But if our minds, our hearts are on things in the earth made new, where will our heart be also over there? So how will we feel down here as a stranger, as a pilgrim? Hear me now, friends. That means not only did Abraham see himself as a pilgrim, a stranger in the earthly land of promise, but even Sarah, his wife. Oh, friends, what's the application? It means then both husband and wife must accept the label of God that they are pilgrims and strangers on this earth. And the Bible tells us that Abraham taught that principle to Isaac and Jacob. Isaac taught Jacob that this earth is not your home. Friends, think about this. Abraham was rich, wealthy. Isaac, wealthy. Jacob got received a few inheritance. Yet the Bible says that Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, they lived in tents. Why tents, friends? What would the tents represent today? Why in tents? They were always on the move. Look with me. Verse number 9. The second phrase says, it says, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Wait a minute. So where was Abraham? Abraham was in the earthly inheritance the land of promise Canaan but the Bible says he was looking for another city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God wait a minute which city is this that has 12 foundations this is New Jerusalem, praise God. Write down the 21st chapter of Revelation and verse number 14. This is the city with 12 foundations. So what's the application? Like Abraham, while we are here on this earth, and the Pope, Obama, and the rest are talking about, let's enforce Sunday laws, let's tax Let's enforce the national Sunday law with persecution. Let's force all nations to pay money. Let's tax them. While this is going on, God's people on their mind should be what? The coming city, praise God, that has 12 foundations, New Jerusalem. How close are we, my friends? Skip on down. Skip on down. Verse number Verse number 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Is that clear, friends? They died not having received the promise. But where were they? Verse number 8 and 9 says, they sojourned in the land of promise. But they knew earth was not the land of promise. But New Jerusalem, 
the new earth as a result. What did they confess? Verse number 13 says, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. So my friends, if we profess to be sons and daughters of God, sons and daughters of Abraham, what should we also confess right now? That we are but strangers and pilgrims. This is why the songwriter says, I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger. I can tarry. I can tarry. But a night, do not detain me. For I am going. Oh, friends, don't let me finish it. One must we confess that we are strangers. We are pilgrims. We are pilgrims on this earth. Oh, friends, it's so sad because Abraham confessed he was what? A stranger and a pilgrim. But Abraham had a nephew. Who was that? Lot. But what happened to Lot's daughter? Lot's two daughters and Lot's wife. You see, friends, how practical this thing is? Lot's wife, Lot's two daughters never confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims, but they were professing to be God's people. And when they were told destruction is coming, fire and brimstone, Lot's two daughters remain with their husbands in that city and perish in Sodom. And a stanza from that song says, if mother and father won't come, I must leave you and I must go. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger. I can tarry. I can tarry. But a night, let me quickly say this. The angels told Lot's wife, flee as a refugee. Flee. And the Bible says they told her, do not look back. But what did Lot's wife do? She looked back. Why was she looking back? What happened to her as a result of her disobedience? She turned a pillar of salt. I wonder why. Because in Sodom, on this earth, were her treasures. As a result, that was where her heart was. But read now, read now, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 14 says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Pause there again. So those who are seeking to go into glory, that better country, what must they declare? How must they uh, declare themselves? That they are strangers and pilgrims. If you profess that you're going home to glory, what must you call yourself? A Christian who is a pilgrim and a stranger. Let's read on. Verse 15. And truly, look at Lot's wife now in the contrary. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. That's Lot's wife, friends. Her mind was still back on Sodom. But where was Abraham's mind? On the heavenly kingdom. Where must our minds be? Verse 16. But now they desire a better country. That is, and heavenly, wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hold your place in Hebrews chapter 11. Go now with me to 1 Peter. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, my friends, if we plan to seek for that better country, we must confess Confess sincerely, we are pilgrims and strangers on this earth. And the Bible says we have to go beyond a mere profession that we are pilgrims and strangers. The Bible says we must separate ourselves from all apostasy, all worldliness. We must get victory over sin. Look with me, First Peter chapter 2, Father in heaven. Give us more understanding of your word in Christ's name. Amen. Look, 1 Peter 2, verse number 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as what, friends? As strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts 
which war against the soul. So who really are the pilgrims and strangers in God's eyes who will make it into the heavenly country? Those who abstain from worldly lusts, those who abstain from all fleshly desires, the sinful loss of the flesh. Who will give us strength, my friends, to overcome sin? Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Do you see your need is my question. Look with me as we close. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 16 says, But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Wait a minute. Think now, friends. Why does God say he is not ashamed to be called their God. Who's God? Who's God? Those who sincerely profess and confess that they are strangers and pilgrims. God associates himself with his pilgrims and strangers on this earth. Why? Because Jesus, during his first advent, was also a pilgrim, was also a stranger. Listen to me, friends. Do you know why? Because Christ knew his people would have to be pilgrims and strangers on this earth. And it is going to hurt naturally because family members and friends are going to cut us off. Pilgrims, strangers to even loved ones in the flesh. But Jesus says, I know what you are going through. I went through it, praise God. And Christ now says, I will give you strength to remain a pilgrim and a stranger, even though naturally it's going to hurt when friends and family members bar you, marginalize you, and cut you off. Psalm 6 to 9 as we close. Friends, the song is ringing in my ears. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger. I can tarry. I can tarry but a night. Do not detain me, for I am going. Psalm 69, verse number 7. Christ says, Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. For who did Christ bear reproach? For us. Verse 8, Jesus says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. Did Christ's own people treat him as a stranger? Was Christ a pilgrim? Was Christ a stranger even among his own family members? Yes, my friends. What will happen to God's commandment keeping people? It is going to hurt. But Jesus will give us strength. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger, I can tarry, I can tarry, but a night. Psalm 39 says this. This is our prayer now, friends. Remember, every time we read a prayer in Scripture, that prayer must be our prayer. Psalm 39, verse number 12 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. This must be our prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give air. Unto my cry, hold not thy peace at my tears. Why? For I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. It's going to hurt naturally, friends. But all of our fathers, even Jesus, was a sojourner, was a stranger, was a pilgrim. Will Christ give us strength? To endure the experience and the life of a pilgrim and a stranger? The answer is yes. As my wife comes to sing this song of meditation, the song of appeal, I am a pilgrim, I am a stranger. Let these words be the theme, the motto of our hearts.
I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Do not detain me, for I am going to where the fountains are ever flowing. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. There the glory is ever shining. Oh, my longing heart, my longing heart is there. Here in this country, so dark and dreary, I long have wandered, forlorn and weary. I'm a pilgrim, and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Farewell, neighbor, with tears I've warned you. I must leave you, I must leave you and be gone. With this your portion, your heart's desire. Why will you perish? in raging fire. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Father, mother and sister, brother, if you will not journey with me, I must go. Now since your vain hopes you will thus cherish, should I to linger and with you perish? I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Farewell, drear earth, by sin so blighted. In immortal beauty soon you'll be arrayed. He who has formed thee will soon restore thee. And then the dread curse shall never more be. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity to study your words. The signs all around us tell. Babylon is about to completely fall. The signs all around us show us the whole nations are about to be taxed. A one world government is about to be established. Probation's hour is about to close. And many leaders and people within your church are ignorant of these facts. Only a few are awake. Help us to be the wise virgins, having oil in our lamps before probation closes. And while the world is passing laws, while the world is about to enforce a universal international Sunday law with persecution, in the attempt to preserve this earth as their common home, like Abraham, we look for a better country. This world is not our home. Our treasure is not down here. It's over yonder in paradise with you. We are going to be refugees in these last days, but you have promised to preserve us. Praise God. 
we are going to have to declare sincerely that we are pilgrims, strangers on this earth. We are going to have to abstain from every fleshly lust that wars against our soul. But we're so thankful help is available. We are strangers and pilgrims with you, a sojourner as all our fathers were. You became a pilgrim. You became a stranger just for us. People rejected you and you endured just for us. So when we feel the natural pain of people rejecting us, help us to look to you from whence cometh our help. Our help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Save us, we pray, is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.